solving this equation numerically is a challenging task because of two main reasons. The first one is the nonlinearity, as you see there, the saturations is depending on the pressure, and the large, the large variation in the equation coefficients, which come more or less basically from the conductivity tensor. The second one is the requirement of really high resolution, spatially and temporally with discretizations. Either because you need to catch the physics, or either because your domain is really large. You can think about the, the domain that is used in ECHO, which is, is the whole Europe. <coughs> so this has the consequence that efficient usage of high performance computer resources is a critical point. So Pavlov is an integrated parallel watershed model which simulates both surface and subsurface flow. For the subsurface part, it provides a solver for the Richards equation, which is based on a cell-centered final difference approach. The code is built using a distributed parallelism. It is suitable for large-scale simulations, and it has shown excellent solver scalability for up to 16,000 processes. And here, when I speak about processes, I use it as a synonym for MPI rank. So you might now ask the question, okay, 16,000 processes, oh, it's, it's, it's a really modest number for today's supercomputers. So it, then it becomes the question, what does the code need in order to take advantage of the current machines, or maybe what do we need to do with the code to even to think about running it in the future ones? So the first one you have to do then is to ask and identify the limitations of your code. And basically the bottleneck, or one of the bottlenecks, is that the code is restricted to use a uniform mesh, which makes 3D simulations really expensive at really fine scales. You can think about people who is interested in, in, in the, who is doing root, root modeling and they need really to look at the centimeter scale. So, there are physics happening in some area and they are interested in refining and looking at that area, but you have tied to a uniform mesh and you have to do the whole mesh fine. And sometimes this can be impractical. You can run such big problems even for today's computers, supercomputers. So in the context of, the, of, the, of a project which is funded by the German uh, Research Foundation, it's a, Collaborative research uh, training, uh, collaborative research uh, group. We have a project there which is called Project D8, and I will call it like that in the rest of the slide, which is um, with, in which uh, my advisor, Karsten Gustle from the University of Bonn, on Stefan Kollet from the Research Center Jülich. We have put the goal that we want to develop parallel adaptive solvers for subsurface flow. Why adaptive? Because and we will get rid of this problem. If you need high resolution in some particular area, then you zoom in and only there. And when there is nothing too interesting to happen, then you make the, the mesh course. The tools that we are using for, to, to reach in, for reaching this goal are adaptive mesh refinement using the software library PForest, which is developed by, well, my custom booster is one of the, of the developers, and this is a collaboration effort between the University of Texas and Uni1. Um, afterwards, we need to enhance the discretization because final differences is not so well suited for adaptivity. So we have to switch discretization to mix the final elements. And of course, we will, by changing the discretization, we will change the underlying properties of the linear systems that arise after this cotization. So we need to work with the preconditioners as well. So what does this before this library do? does? Well, basically, you can think the idea is the following. An adaptive mesh can be encoded using a collection of three structures, binary trees or all trees in 3D. And the elements of this mesh can be identified with the, with, the, with the leaves of, the, of those trees. So in the picture, you can think about the big square would be the root node, then it's refined at once, and then you get four childs. This, this, this child here 
it gets refined and it gets new guys and, and so on. Also, and this, this broken line that you see here, it's a so-called space filling curve and it gives you a kind of ordering of the elements of the mesh and it helps you to encode the whole mesh in a the trill has a really nice properties and actually what Triforce does is, is to use this encoding to create and distribute a mesh using MPI parallelism. The Triforce routines that implement those, those things like generating the mesh and distributing it in a parallel machine and of course computing all the parallel neighborhood relations that are known to scale to full contemporary supercomputers. So just to put an example, this here is a plot from the partition routines, and uh, this was John. This was run in the in the supercomputer in the supercomputer center in Jülich. So, in the biggest example, he was able to create and distribute a mesh over 500 billion elements, and using the full machine, and the runtimes are below one second for the partition operation. We have similar. Uh, results for 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 the for the so-called computation of the ghost layer, which is related to the second point there, but we won't make more details about it. So, what is the, the approach of the project D8? Is to introduce adaptive mesh refinement in Pavlov by coupling it with Pforest, in the sense that Pforest will be the new Pavlov's oracle from the mesh. And the second thing, which is the more interesting part, is we need to change finite difference discretization to mix with finite elements, because the layer is more suitable for adaptive meshes. You might ask why are you choosing mixed with finite elements? Well, we have some reasons there. There are some old papers from, from early 90s from, in which it's shown that finite difference is equivalent to mixed with finite elements if you use certain quadrature rules and also the mass conservation and all these things that people doing, uh, doing the physics are interested in. So, the first thing that when you want to... Maybe I should comment something on Pavlo. Pavlo is a kind of rather mature code. It, was, it started at the early 90s and it has gone huge. So, if you want to touch such a fundamental part from the code as like, the machine, then you need to understand it and you have to work with it and then you have to look basically where you want to make surgery to code and put your new code without rewriting the whole pathway because this, this would be out of the scope of the project. So pathway splits the computational grid in normal overlapping blocks which are called subgrids. Each subgrid is assigned to a unique process in the parallel machine and subgrids and processes are logically arranged in lexicographic order. So already you see a problem there. Uh, the, the, how you split the mesh, you need to use as many as, you need as many as, as, as many processes as subgrids. And this already poses a bottleneck or a problem. It's an issue in the, in the, in the granularity of, the, of your parallelization. So what is our idea? Remember that a preforest structure, the mesh is represented by a tree, and each element of the tree is one portion of the mesh. So what we want to do is we want to place one subgrid structure from Pavlov in each of the leaves of the preforest. And of course, we have to choose the size of the subgrid such that we get a mesh that is kind of similar if the user has, doesn't want to use preforest. Hopefully, by doing this, eventually, we will use Pforest to adapt here. And the idea is that we also adapt Pavlo mesh. Of course, there is a lot of work to be done here because you have to write interpolation operators here in these spaces. And but um, yeah, this is more related to future work. So we have done already that to do this coupling. And, and now we can pose a question and maybe we can ask uh, if we already gained something by doing this coupling. So in general, I put this slide of kind of 
how you will audit an MPI code in general. And for the case of Pablo, the first thing you should do is identify the main workflow of your code, which in the case of Pablo looks like that. In the main code, you have a solver set up in this phase. It's where you read the parameters for the simulation, you assemble the mathematical operators, you create the grids, you create basically all the preprocessing is, is done there. Then it comes a time loop, and within, within this time loop, it comes the call to the solver, which actually computes the numerical solution of the Richards equation. After you don't have a picture of that, of that kind, then of course you will try to perform scaling studies. And I will, what I did, I put time counters exactly there in this part to see how these things perform. And to optimize complicated things, then you can use instrumentation tools like Scorpy, Bumpil, Tau, etc. You can use the service from the Echo, this partnership of um, optimization and performance, and they do this for you for free, which is great. <clears throat> so these two plots uh, show what is going on now. This is the in the first plot, you can see that, um, okay, this is a weak scaling exercise, so ideally the, the, the time should stay flat. In a weak scaling exercise, you take a problem, and then you increase the size of the problem in the same proportion of the number of processes, and if everything is perfect, you should get constant time runtime, which we see is not the case in the, in the top plot. In blue, you see the total runtime is increasing. When you split it out in between solver setup and solver, then you notice that the responsible of such behavior is the solver setup. The same happened here down, down in, the, in, the, in, the, in a memory plot. Here I'm plotting the maximum memory used by a processor. I, take, I took the maximum of all of them. And you see that this is increasing exponentially in the same proportions as you add processors. So why is this is happening? situation in the top, this is because we found out that during the solver setup you have loops that run over the MPI size and this is really bad because then processors are doing work proportional to the number of processors you, you use. And the reason of this plot of the memory is because the mesh metadata is replicated in every processor. Basically every processor in the standard version of Pablo holds a whole copy of the, of the full grid. So what are the solutions of these two issues? So for course, in the first case, replace loop proportional to MPI size with constant size loops, and really implement a strictly, strictly distributed storage of the mesh. So this is what happens when with, with, with a modified version of Pablo. Just what I said in a, in a picture, in A, you can see the default, the, the view from processor P star from the mesh, from a two-dimensional mesh. So every processor owns this guy, and it has access to the whole mesh, because afterwards, internally, the code needs to compute who are the neighborhoods of this mesh based on the stances you use on the discretization. When we do it with PForest, we, from the beginning, we fit the code with the right to greet the, the actual ones which are supposed to be the neighbors. So, in situation A, Pablo before was doing, okay, I need to figure out who are my neighbors. I ask here, no, this is not. This, yes, this, not, this, yes. And of course, it doesn't make sense after two rows. Um, the impact of this solution is, is huge. As you see in, in figure A, uh, it's the same plot as before, with the, with the bad scaling behavior from the solver setup. And in, in plot B, then you can see, um, first, due to this memory problem, we were not able to run the code in Uquim for more than 32,000 processes. Now, with PFORES, we can use the full machine. In this study, we use only half of the machine. And you see that the scalability bottleneck in the solver setup is gone. Here in 32 processes, uh, 32,000 processes, you are running nearly 1,000 seconds, and now solver, the solver setup is below two seconds in every run. 
we have similar results with the, for the for the for the memory allocation. So you see again the same thing. Uh, um, in the left, the memory was increasing exponentially in the same proportion with of you add processes. And with P4, as you are able to use much more processes, the, the memory stays nice, flat, like a kind of textbook picture from weak scaling, up to say 60,000, 32,000 processes. Then we have um, some increase, but the still is it's better than we have before. So, what is the current state of the code? The code is backwards compatible with the upstream version of Pavlo. You can compile before, uh, Pavlo with P4S, and if you want to use it, this is a matter of a configuration variable. It's, you decide on really on runtime. And uh, with P4S enabled, the code is case to the full Uquin machine to the, to the for nearly half a million uh, processes. And this is what is shown here in this picture. This is a strong scaling study for three different kind of problem size. In the biggest problem, we have, pro uh, uh, we have a problem with 10 billion uh, grid points, and, and you see the really nice strong scaling. And th thanks to these results, um, the code was included in the, in the HiQ club from the Research Center Julius, which is a list of codes which are able to scale to the full machine. And so far, I look at it yesterday, and there are only 28 codes listed there. Um, all the developments I have shown you here, uh, they are summarized in a paper which was submitted to publication, and this is the, the address of the preprint. Um, what we are working right now is we are now dealing with the preconditioners for a kind of discretization that will arrive from a mixed final elements that we want to use in Pablo, namely to have the Thomas elements of degree zero, which is the ones which are equivalent to fixing finite differences. We are doing this in a prototype code because Pavlov is such a big code that just testing things there is not a good idea. So we have our own code to play with what we want to put on it, and when we think it is good, we put it into Pavlov. And additionally, we are also working in, at least technically, in the migration from final difference to mixed final elements. And yeah, I would like to finish my presentation by acknowledging uh, course funding from the German Research Foundation and the House of Center for Mathematics in the University of Bonn, and the compute time from the Super so Research Center Jülich for the, being able to show these nice plots. And thank you for your attention.